Cool. All right, hey everyone, good morning. Uh, I'm Tyler, I'm doing the intro to Policy Lab here at GNDI, and uh, we're gonna talk about research this wonderful morning. Um, so who here has done like a research project at school? Okay, so like everyone, who here enjoyed doing their research project? Select few. Okay, so I think research is definitely an underappreciated part of uh, debate as you start getting into it. Uh, uh, conducting really good research is something that can take a little bit of time to develop as a skill, but once you really get going, uh, it actually becomes uh, a lot of fun and you get really good at it and you get exposed to like a huge diversity of arguments and you know points of view you may not have considered. Um, so, um, yeah, some big benefits of research. So a lot of people join debate um, so that they can genuinely uh, learn more about the world and what's going on in it, uh, as well as just controversies uh, that, uh, yeah, that affect people's everyday lives. Um, so that's a huge part of, uh, or something that you can really get out of debate. Next you can, as most of you, uh, put your hand up. Um, you are going to be doing a lot of research projects uh, during high school as well as into further into your academic career. So developing those skills from debate is something that um, I think most debaters can say uh, has been really helpful to them in their academic success. Uh, third, um, you can uh, talk with your partner and your teammates and you can think, uh, toss around ideas. You can't do that without really getting a good understanding uh, of like what's uh, what's being said on the certain topic that you're, um, you're you're thinking about, whether it's a one big topic like policy debate where you have like a, a whole year to really go into depth onto certain issues or uh, just getting exposed to uh, a lot of different arguments as you do with LD or PF um, every, every month or so when you get a, a whole new topic. So um, you also learn how to uh, distinguish between sources that are credible and that are not credible. So you can weed out the fake news um, and really make sure that we're getting, uh, we're presenting arguments that are the best version of those arguments. And then lastly, all of these things will help you become a better debater overall. Okay, so first thing, uh, approaching the research process, uh, mindset is very important. So first, have an open mind. Um, so this can come when you kind of just get the topic, whether it's early in the year or you've just like the brief has come out and you just kind of want to learn a little bit more about the topic. Um, definitely just like having an open mind about what avenues you might want to uh, want to go down, what arguments you may um, think you might want to, or what arguments that you could, uh, you could run. Um, have an open mind about what, um, yeah, what, uh, what you might be, what you might be finding. Don't go into research with a certain set of expectations and get frustrated when those expectations are not met, you know, to the T. Um, finding new things is definitely something that is like a huge help in debate uh, because you can approach problems from more creative angles. Next, uh, stay positive. So during your research projects, for example, I'm sure it might have gotten a little bit might have dragged on a little bit long or maybe not have found like the research that you wanted to right away, uh, but stay positive. At this point in time, in 2019, like information on almost anything is out there and there are definitely lots of ways to get it, especially online for free. Um, so learning how to in, like hone your research skills will allow you to like find the arguments that you're looking for um, and yeah, prepare better cases. Third is get creative when uh, you might not find what you're looking for right away. Um, think about, like, take a minute to think about who would be writing about this, right? What are the arguments that, like, I'm looking for? Uh, how can I, like, mix up my search terms to really um, get the best of what is out, like, of the literature that's out there on a certain topic? Um, just by, like, expanding, what, like, the field of what you're looking for and then going uh, going from there. And last I'll say is dig deeper. So if, if you're kind of like researching a lot, sometimes I find there's going to be some annoying thing that comes up. Like I have to learn about some like 
treaty or like peace deal. And I don't want to deal with that right now. It's not really what I'm focused on. But if I just dig a little deeper and I try to uh, figure out what's going on with that thing that keeps popping up and I take the time to actually learn about it, then I can understand how certain things relate to other arguments that I may not have considered before. So if you're ever like hitting a wall, sometimes it's just good to dive in and just be like, all right, I'm going to become an expert in like X thing. And that's totally fine. It's really going to help me in this area. OK. Um, yeah, I thought I'd just tack on a few quick study tips that are probably pretty pertinent to you just doing like your homework, like writing a paper or whatever. They're all like pretty applicable for conduct, like doing your own research. The first is uh, finding a place where you can focus. Um, for me, it's like coffee shops. Like I just like go to a Panera and I know I can sit down there for like a couple hours and just like bang out a few, like a, like a, a couple, a, quite a few cards. Um, just because I know that place is where I can be like the most productive. So if you have a place, it's going to be different for everybody. Just like if, whether or not it's your room, it's like outside on the porch, wherever it is. Um, find a place where you can focus and you're not going to be distracted by other things. You can't do all of those things that I missed before. You're not focused. You can't dig deeper, get creative, stay positive. We're not really focused on the project at hand. Uh, next is uh, keep going and finish what you start. Um, research is often done in like a good, I would say like an hour or two is like a good time for you to uh, sit down and try to do the research that you want to do. If you kind of just do like 10 minutes, take an hour long break, come back for another 10 minutes, two hour long break, really not going to have the momentum to keep going. You're going to lose the trains of thought that maybe you, you had while you were finding uh, finding um, articles or um, new journals uh, that would help support your your argument. Okay, next, uh, to take breaks. Sometimes, yeah, don't get like tunnel vision. I would say if you're if you're at your laptop for like more than like two, three hours, like it's just like way better to uh, take a step back, go take a walk, I don't know, spend time with your dog, whatever. Um, to, uh, I give you the time to step away and I can't tell you the number of times when I've just like, uh, hit a wall, and then when I'm driving home, it suddenly just like dawns on me like what I really need to do um, in order to like keep going or to find what I need to find. Um, okay, and then last is just ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, a lot of you will have to be coaches uh, or just like staff, like teachers, um, friends, like um, more experienced debate members uh, that are going to be able to like help you out when you're looking for a specific argument, when you're trying to approach something from a certain way, um, just because they may have been doing this for longer than you have. And research is definitely a skill that you're going to want to like other people can help you out with because they've uh, spent time developing those techniques. OK. So uh, sources and credibility, first topic we can talk about. Oops. Hopefully we will. OK. So identifying a credible source. So when we're out there looking for, um, yeah, for research, we want to make sure that it comes from somewhere that uh, we know we can trust, right? So I'm going to give you a few examples of um, certain sources. We're going to say whether or not we think we might we might tr trust that source in question. So, an article from an academic journal or think tank. Who thinks that's probably a credible source? About about half. Okay. Uh, for me, I would probably I would probably say if something was published in like a peer reviewed academic journal or if it's a think tank that is known for being reputable on a certain issue, I think these are these are pretty safe bets, right? Um, it's very unlikely that any academic journal with like any reputation at all is publishing something from like, I don't know, a nine-year-old blogger, right? Um, these, these articles are, are probably pretty good. That being said, I think uh, a lot of you are right to be skeptical of certain sources. As we know, academic journals in the past have published things that are obviously wrong, right? Um, so 
I would say this is like probably a pretty good start. Um, and the best versions of these articles are probably like the gold standard for conducting debate research. Okay, how about an article from a newspaper? All right, hands up if you think that you could, you, you would look into a newspaper when you're doing research, like an online newspaper. Hands a little bit higher. Okay, so about, about the same. Um, yeah, I, I would say, um, just take a look at what, um, like generally these are pretty good. Newspapers, like the point of news sources is to publish like factual things that are true. Um, so in that regard, they might not help you with your argument um, if you want someone to help you, because like say something we should do. And then you've got to be careful for newspapers that publish commentary from people who may not be credible. Um, so like the New York Times, for example, a year, two years, a year ago, two years ago, published, uh, added someone to staff who was like a climate change skeptic and people were very upset about it. Um, so if you believe in climate change, which I hope you all do, you might, you might have an issue with like a commentary piece from that individual about climate change. Okay, next, how about this one? A grad student's dissertation. And so they, okay, so a few of you. Okay, I would say this is probably a gray area, right? If I was kind of, this would probably be my my last resort, right? Does anyone think why 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 would a grad student's dissertation be not be a source that we could trust, like on like on face? Yes. Could be wrong. Sure, yeah. There are a lot of grad students out there, and a lot of them can be wrong about things. Okay, yeah. Do you recognize yourself reported in the future? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, okay, Avanish. Yeah, uh, for it, yeah. If they are doing that, probably, but a dissertation is probably for them to like get a degree so it would be in the field. You're in, hopefully. Yes, Keon. Uh, this is what? Oh, it's like a paper or like a like a topic, like an argument that you prepare for when you want to graduate from grad school. So a lot, a lot of times people conduct like big like research projects because it's like them finishing up like their academic career. So, yeah. Yes. It could be. A, yeah. Um, it, is that always necessarily a bad thing? Like, okay. Okay, so uh, Shachi. Yeah, they're just trying to graduate. They don't really care. That's totally valid. Uh, okay, so definitely those are, are some reasons why you might not trust a, uh, a dissertation. Uh, I agree with all that. For me, yeah, this falls into the total gray area um, because this person has probably spent a lot of time either conducting primary or secondary research. So like going out and conducting like interviews and stuff like on their own or looking at the literature that's out there uh, because they want to they have a good um, like dissertation. Um, at the same time, these kind of things are not necessarily subject to like peer review. Um, they might have like the help of like a faculty member. In fact, that's probably pretty likely and a reason why you could trust this sort of source. Uh, but it might totally, it, it might be something that's just like a total hot take, really just trying to make a mark um, at school. And it's not really, once it's published, they might not really care about it coming under any scrutiny. So I would say this is just kind of like last resort, fine if you need to. All right, and post on Reddit. Who thinks that's credible? Wow, we've got two braver than the US Marines, those two, great. Okay, yeah. Oh, it's just like an internet forum where like anyone can like go on, find certain subjects. So yeah, definitely not but I have seen it happen, people cutting research from Reddit posts. However, one thing I will say, 
even about all of these things is that the source, um, the, the credibility of the source definitely does matter to the argument that you're making. Um, so yeah, if a grad student's dissertation um, said something about, like you wanted to figure out how people in higher education felt about a certain issue, then that's a great source, right? Um, but yeah, uh, so that's just something you wanna keep in mind throughout the whole time. Um, I've come up with like four kind of factors to consider. There are probably more things than that that you should look at when you're looking at a source, but I thought these four were generally a good good starter, like litmus tests um, and questions you should ask yourself uh, when you're like thinking about the credibility of the source. Okay, first is the author. Is there an author, right? This is something that's just totally published online anonymously um, that may or may not be something that uh, would be a pretty negative um, reason uh, to cut that article. Can anyone think why that might be? Why would it be bad to like, like have a card in a debate that's from like an anonymous source? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and even if they do, you can't prove that they do, right? Um, sometimes they'll be from like other pub like they'll be from publications like the Congressional Research Service often publishes anonymous articles. But if you know it's from a publication, maybe you can say like, hey, this person might be qualified. But if it's like a self-published anonymous online blog post, that's a pretty clear indicator. Um, it's probably not a credible source. Um, do they have relevant experience is really the next question I'd ask myself. So someone might be an, extra, uh, an expert in like architecture or something. They're not really qualified to say anything about like Iran's missile program, right? So just thinking about the experience they have, they might be super qualified. They might have gone to like 30 different grad schools and have all the degrees and be like knighted by the queen. But if they don't have like the relevant experience to make your argument, then you might not uh, want to like you might not want to hedge your debates uh, on articles cut from that author. And then lastly, of course, think about bias. Is there any reason that the author might be biased to exaggerate or distort a certain position? Um, so, from the does everyone remember from the public forum debate, the demonstration debate? This came up when a an argument about the Belt and Road Initiative. The article supporting that argument was from the Belt and Road website to promote investment in the Belt and Road. So you might you might think about questions like that um, when you're thinking about the source. Um, okay, next is the publication. Next, uh, what is the focus of the publication? By this I mean something pretty similar to having relevant experience. Um, so there's going to be certain think tanks, or certain academic journals, certain you know websites, online magazines that might have a particular focus, uh, but it's not uncommon for them to try to branch out and post things that maybe not are not within their sphere of experience. And that's something you should really consider whether or not that uh, that is something that um, disqualifies that evidence or cuts against that evidence you know, in, in a debate. Um, what does the publication have a particular reputation uh, is something that can come across or that can be very important as well. Um, for example, um, there are a lot of think tanks that might have a certain ideological bias. Um, places like the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute are known for being pretty conservative. Um, so you would want to be able to defend that uh, source coming from a conservative, like a known conservative leaning organization might be uh, a good thing in the context that you're arguing. Um, uh, yeah, you, you need to ask those questions yourself, whether or not you, I would think you would want to defend that institution in the debate um, from attacks coming from that side. Next, uh, the date. How old is too old in the context of your argument, right? Um, so, there are going to be certain like arguments that are going to like last uh, forever. Statements about like society, the way uh, like 
things are like the economy is structured um, are probably going to be things haven't drastically changed probably in the last 20, 30 years. So any argument from that time frame is probably going to be fine, right? Um, probably, possibly even longer, maybe even shorter, right? So that's something you, you a question you just have to ask yourself uh, in the context of your argument. You need to think about have there been any significant changes that could disprove or alter your argument? Um, so if on the policy app, you're trying to talk about Iran's like missile program, and you're going to say that they are 100% have like uh, a nuclear weapon, it's totally verified, but that evidence is from like 2014, just like before the Iran deal, before like international inspectors kind of came in to like look at Iran's nuclear program, that might be something that has happened since the time of the publication that might have disproven your argument. Okay, next. Uh, so th yeah, this one, academic or general consensus. So does the source seem to fit in with what most other sources are saying? So a lot of times, it, um, actually, sorry. When you see an article that kind of cuts against everything you've been seeing, you've been searching for like two hours and suddenly you come across an article that says the polar opposite of what all of the other articles that you've been looking at say. Um, that may or may not be a good thing. Uh, it might be a really good thing to, for someone to have like a, a take that challenges like conventional wisdom um, and is someone like thinking on their own and like has evidence to back up that point. Or that really might just be a troll, an instigator, someone just trying to make some noise, right? Um, however, it's important for you. That's why you can't, I think you can't just like approach the research process and go out and find one article and be like, all right, I know it all. This is kind of a definitive statement on what's happening in the world. That's really why you need to broaden the scope of your research and figure out what most people are saying and why this particular source might be saying something different than the overwhelming consensus. All right. Does anyone have any questions about sources and credibility? Yes. Uh, sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Have you been like an old policy that has changed like a lot in the recent times? Did you say, are we going to debate like, an old policy? Oh, yeah. Uh, remember. Did you use that thing on argument that already happened? Um, I mean, yeah, in certain contexts you can be, you can be, I think you're probably thinking of the demo, the bit of the demo debate we watched, which was from 2016 and said that Hillary was going to win the election. So that hurt me as a former Hillary campaign staffer. Uh, but um, I think it could, it could be relevant. You could just be saying, well, hey, everyone in 2016 thought Hillary was going to win. That might be a reason why polls are not the gold standard to determine who wins an election, right? Because most people said Hillary would win because the polls were in her favor, right? Um, so yeah, you can you can definitely bring that in. Did I see a hand? Okay, cool. We got all that. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, sources to avoid. I just put some on. We've kind of covered some of these. So blogs, internet forums, uh, like you know, like Reddit, social media, Twitter, Facebook. Generally, not great places um, for you to like get the building blocks of your argument. And then fourth, just like hyper political or propaganda websites, probably should stay away. Uh, try to identify those as quickly as possible. Don't get sucked down the rabbit hole. Okay. Okay, so resources. Um, so first, I just kind of wanted to cover, uh, in case a lot of you don't know this for debate, there are a lot of online published resources that you can you have access to uh, in 
policy public forum LD. So policy, um, it's a good site called Open Evidence or Open Ev. Um, at the end of the summer or sometime around then, all of the debate camps, just like this one, will post a lot of the files and the cards that they put online, which will be like uh, totally open for everyone to access. So say like if you're from a school and maybe you have like a pretty latent like a debate program, there are always online resources that you can uh, go to. I think the full URL is something like openev.debatecoaches.org. Um, and you can totally pull from that to get uh, the relevant policy debate uh, evidence that you need uh, for your upcoming season. Um, sites to check. Um, so for policy at the beginning of every year, there's a topic paper. Um, and that's been out since like February for the high school topic. And then there are briefs that come out for each topic for PF and LD. Um, so for the topic paper for policy, you can check the, I guess like National Federation of, I'm not gonna say, nfhs.org, and then speechanddebate.org is where you can get the briefs for PF and LD. Um, if you have any questions about where to get like resources like that after the camp, just totally make sure to make see your lab leader who will help you out. Um, so that once you leave the camp during the school year, you like are all set. Okay, and then also debateus.org, which is like formerly millennial SD, uh, is a really good place to pull evidence uh, for all three kinds of debate. Um, the reason I just put this up here is that it can be just a really good like um, starting point. Um, so there might not be a, like, having access to these resources allows you to put your like research skills to use, just like building on those arguments, developing um, so that you can have like the best version of your argument. Um, and you don't necessarily need to cut the exact same file that's already available for you online. Um, so yeah, you can expand your research field. Okay, now Google. Your number one resource. Google is your friend. Don't overthink it. Don't think you need to. You need to necessarily go to like some fancy like academic database or like go try like some uh, like go into the deep web. Right? Google. Google has everything. Pretty great search algorithm. Everyone starts there. Right? So when you're looking on Google, don't overthink it. If you just if you're like just coming into a topic, you want to get like a good understanding of like where the where the literature is. Just just like search what you're thinking. Totally fine. Once you once you take it from there, you can really build um, and develop your search terms to get more narrow articles. Um, but Google has a does a really good job of kind of telling you where the big articles that a lot like everybody else is also going to be reading and uh, that knowledge that everybody else is going to have. So Google. Uh, one tip, don't give up after the first page. I think you need to be looking well into like the 10th up to the 20th page um, to find everything you can to really scrape the bottom of the barrel there. Because um, you, like a lot of the time, you will find something on like the 18th page. That being said, if you haven't found anything, none of it is relevant. You may want to refine your search terms, right? Um, but don't give up after the first page. It's definitely what I would do. Okay, third, read the previews, right? Does everyone know what I'm talking about with this? Just like this little layer here that pops, like we'll have like the kind of where your search term popped up within the site. Um, those are so, like, oftentimes a lot more helpful than reading the title um, that's there. Because, um, for, like for example, take a look at this one. The EU's problematic approach to China's Belt and Road Initiative. We don't really like. You might be looking for a specific problem with it. Um, this article does not really tell you what that is. But if you just read here, you can already see that Italy joining the Europe, uh, the BRI, um, means that the European Union is not. Connected. You already know the reason, like the China, like the top level argument that that argument or that article is making, um, and you may decide whether or not to pursue that article. Okay, how many people know about Google's like search terms, like search commands? Anyone heard of like these, a few people? Okay, so Google has certain like things 
you can plug into the algorithm. I don't know, fancy words. I'm just gonna show you how to use them. That can really help you narrow your search term, find things that you wouldn't be able to find for, uh, find uh, without them. So first is quotes. When you put something like a quote around your search term, Belt and Road Initiative, it will only show uh, like sources like that have that phrase exactly, right? Without those, you could Belt and Road Initiative, you might get a link to like JC Penney on like their belt sales, right? Uh, within the quotation marks, pretty specific Belt and Road Initiative. That's you know China's big infrastructure project. Those are the articles that you're going to find. Right. Next, uh, plus and minus signs. So plus, uh, you just add something on um, to uh, your search term to expand, like to get results for that as well. And then the minus, I think, um, is something I use all of the time because you might be uh, looking into something um, and something very recent has happened um, in the in that like like in the topic that you're looking into. Um, and you're not really interested in that, right? So you're looking about looking into the Belt and Road Initiative and you kind of just want to find out more about what China is up to in like Southeast Asia or like the EU, like the PF topic is. But all these articles are coming up with things about India's position on the BRL. So at the end there, you can just do minus India and it will take out all of the search results that have India in them. Very, very useful. You'll come across this a lot when you're just like, like going through things and just like not interested, not interested. Why? I don't want to hear about this. Take a minus to it. All right. An asterisk. Yeah, I'm really bad at the SK sounds. That thing. Um, so it, you can use it to replace a word um, in a search term. So if you know there's a, 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 the title of an article and you just can't quite remember it or something got messed up, it got republished as something, something happens, you just don't remember a certain word or you're looking for a certain word to fill that position, um, just do belt and asterisk initiative and that will show results probably for belt and road initiative. Okay. Uh, last is site specific. Um, so here you can just type site colon and then the, the website that you want to look for. And then after that, you like you would type what you're looking for within that website. So a lot of times you might go to a think tank, you might do site colon brookings.org.com, .org, um, and then find the articles within that website um, that say something about the topic that you're, you're looking into. Okay. There are actually a lot more of these. These are these are the ones that I use most often. Um, but if you just look Google like Google search commands, there are like 50 different ways that you can tinker with your search terms to make sure you're finding the best things. Okay. Um, here I just kind of listed um, a few like three different genres of uh, places where you can find good, uh, good sources. Um, so academic databases, I think if Google, uh, just regular old Google, isn't getting what you what you need, uh, you might take it up a notch, take it to Google Scholar, which has um, de definitely been improving uh, over the past uh, few years as a research tool. Um, I think they're, they're making it better and better. Um, so there you can get access to just like online published um, academic journals, the articles written within them. Um, JSTOR is also one which has like a huge database uh, of journal articles. Um, JSTOR isn't free, but very often your high school um, or um, possibly even your debate program will have access to those kind of databases. Um, you should really, you, you can check with your um, like high school library or your teacher or someone to make sure you have access to that. And then in college, um, most universities have that there. Um, but if you can get access to JSTOR, I would highly recommend it because you can uh, 
one, just search directly for articles, and then two, go like search through all of the academic journals in a certain topic area, and then search within that journal. Um, so that way you're not searching the whole, the whole internet at one time. You just want to find like critical Asian American studies. There's a journal on that, like going to be several journals on that within JSTOR, um, and you can just search what you need to find out there. Um, LexisNexis, ProQuest, Pine Online, really ton of academic da databases. This is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, but really finding out what databases that you have access to can really help you take your research to the next level. Okay. Um, so with think tanks, um, a lot of these um, will publish research and commentary articles online for free, uh, which is obviously fantastic for us uh, to have easy, easy access to qualified information. So a few examples can be Brookings, RAND, Cato Institute, Center for American Progress. Um, I have a pretty broad-based uh, you know, range of uh, things that they, they write about. Um, I think I think all three topics that we're working on right now in the camp have something to do with international relations. So I just kind of put up a few suggestions there. Council on Foreign Relations, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, CIA, CSIS, um, Center for Strategic International Studies, um, are all really good, pretty prolific uh, places find articles. Next, news sites, magazines, general news, again, uh, like New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera. Um, so these can be very useful for what I said earlier about kind of gauging what's going on, like the debate that's happening right now in a certain area, um, because they're really just reporting, they'll probably, they might be reporting on meetings or summits or blah, blah, blah. I can just tell you what's going on right now. Um, international relations magazines like Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, uh, The Diplomat is about Asia Pacific um, thing. So for PF, that might be helpful. Um, and then for political updates, you're in policy, trying to cut a politics to sad, Hill, Politico, 538, <laughs> Roll Call. Um, so all of these, like so these things are, uh, yeah, again, not an exhausted list. And as you, if you do the upfront, like really just Googling it, finding out what think tanks, what institutions, what journals are like expert and expert uh, like sources in uh, that particular field is a really good way to go. Um, yeah, can anyone think of any other kinds of sources that maybe they could consult? Um, where perhaps you have found evidence from in your own debate careers. Yes? It's like the big cards. I think that's one of the things. If you're just looking for a very specific card, you can just look it up and then you'll find it. It's like, it's like, it takes like a little bit of evidence and other big sources that publish cards already, and then you can actually get oh, a really. different card. And it's, it's free though, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. Debate die cards. Actually, should have put that on this. Is it debate.cards that's something or I actually haven't used that one, so uh, but yeah if you're if you're looking for certain yeah if you're looking for card specific and not uh, kind of going to the going to the sources, yeah, those kind of places are great. The high school and uh, has a wiki as well where uh, teams publish like the cards that they read online. Um, so be, yeah, be creative. I think the more you're exposed to arguments, like the better, uh, like the more access you have to them, the easier you can access them, the better off you're gonna be. Um, but a critical research, it, a critical skill for you all is also just learning how to do it, you know, from scratch. You're not finding something that you want to, to argue or there's something that you're interested in that you kind of wanna find out more about. 
uh, debate is really a, can be a really good avenue for you to explore that. Um, and yeah, research, it's fun. Okay, um, I think I'm about, I'm about done. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the research process that I can answer right now? Sorry, so take that from the top. The first slide. This one? Sure. Okay, anything else? Both. Yeah. Okay, um, I think I'm, I'm uh, yeah, that's it for me today. Thank you. Uh, you're, how are we gonna do that? I got it. Hannah's gonna take over from here. Thank you. All right, so now is research time. So since everyone's already in this room, we're just gonna keep you here to keep things a little simpler. But what I do want you all to do is just kind of split up by lab. So I want all the middle schoolers to go over that direction. And then Adit's going to come talk to you all. Can you pause that video?